good morning to everyone. We've got folks across the country joining us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Gillick, and I am the program director for the Northwest chapter of the American Parkinson Disease Association. Uh, the American Parkinson Disease Association, or APDA for short, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and works to assist the nearly 1 million Americans with Parkinson's disease. Our Northwest chapter based here in Seattle is part of this grassroots network and we work with the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska to provide support, education, and services that will help everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease live life to the fullest. You can visit our website at apdaparkinson.org to learn about the array of programs and services offered by our organization. Today's program is part of a series of programs that we do here in the Northwest called Take Control. They are designed to give everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease an opportunity to learn from experts in the field. We normally do these in person and are starting to broadcast them and now we've moved completely virtual. Um, we developed these programs because we know that Parkinson's disease is a complex disorder and it can affect everybody differently. And so we at APDA believe that the more you know, the more empowered you can become in living your best life with this complex disorder. Today's program is about pain in Parkinson's disease. Pain in Parkinson's disease is kind of an historically under-recognized and under-treated non-motor symptom of the disease. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Kamani, who's going to give us a lot of information about this topic, I'd like to give the sponsors for our program an opportunity to say hello. Uh, their financial support of APDA allows us to do programs like this one and provide the services that we do. So Keely from Boston Scientific is here. Do you want to say hello to the audience for a second? Sure. Hi. Thanks, Jen, and thanks uh, everyone for letting me say hello. I just thought I'd make a quick introduction of myself and how I fit into the Parkinson's community. I've been working in the Parkinson's community for the last 15 years. And for the last 13 years of that time, I've been working with deep brain stimulation. So it's my honor to work with people living with Parkinson's and deep brain stimulation. And it's also my pleasure to answer questions if anyone has things that they want to know more about DBS and the latest technology and Jen knows how to get a hold of me, anybody at the APDA. So if anyone has questions, they want to reach out, just ask them for my contact info and I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Keely. And yeah, you can email me um, at, at our office and I will um, get you in touch with Keely if you have um, questions. And also Amniel and Abbott are sponsors for this event. So thank you to them um, for sponsoring. They weren't able to actually to make it today. So without further ado, let's move on to the main event. Today, Dr. Kamani will present information to you about pain in Parkinson's disease. After the presentation, we'll open the program to questions. So please use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen to answer any questions. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the APDA Northwest YouTube channel early this next week. And now, I am pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Pravin Kamani. Dr. Kamani is fellowship trained in both neuromuscular disorders and movement disorders, and he practices at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle. He is the author of a number of publications on Parkinson's disease, including one recently published about pain in Parkinson's disease. And he is an investigator on several clinical trials. He is also a member of the APDA Northwest Board of Directors and really an all around great guy. So thank you for being here, Dr. Kamani. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. And now I am going to exit the stage and give you full control. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Heather from APDA for organizing this, uh, this our very first um, uh, virtual um, talk, uh, educational talk. We've done a few of these in the past. I'd like to thank the audience uh, who have taken time out in their busy day today to be um, a part of this, uh, this um, learning, hopefully interactive, 
uh, discussion. I'd like to thank my colleagues um, from Boston Scientific, Healy Daly, um, and from Am Neal and Abbott for sponsoring this program. So as Jen said, um, this talk is about pain in Parkinson's disease, um, which is under-recognized, under-treated. However, it is a very common non-motor symptom in Parkinson's disease. The learning objectives of today's talk are to discuss causes of pain in Parkinson's disease, um, to treat pain by optimizing treatment of Parkinson's disease, and then to learn treatment strategies for other causes of pain in Parkinson's disease. This talk is not about pain in general. Um, as we'll see, pain is contextual. And uh, a disclaimer, I will answer as many general questions as possible, but I really cannot give individual medical advice about doses of medications and what to do about individual clinical scenarios because this is not a prescriptive talk. It's more about a general overview for specific questions about treatment of your symptoms. You have to talk to your um, individual um, physician. So what is pain? Um, it's a complex question, complex answer. It can be philosophical, but believe it or not, there is a technical and a clinical definition that's put forth by the International Association for Study of Pain, first in 1973, and then it was modified in 2011. Pain is described as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Um, seems like a bunch of experts and maybe a lawyer came together and wrote this definition. They wanted to capture as many things as possible about pain, but truly, um, you know, to paraphrase Larry Flint, I know pain when I feel it, but I may not be able to describe it. So it is a sensory experience. It is a perception. Uh, and pain truly is in the body and brain of the beholder, someone who experiences it. Pain in Parkinson's disease, however, uh, which is the context uh, of, uh, of today's talk, uh, is typically chronic recurrent and intermittent pain throughout the course of the illness. Uh, it is a specific kind of pain associated with the disease or with various other um, uh, comorbidities or diseases that can be seen uh, within the context of Parkinson's disease. And it's most commonly reported by patients um, who've had the disease for at least three to four years. Sometimes it can be a, a presenting complaint of the disease itself, but there is an association with severity of disease and severity of pain um, this chronic recurrent and intermittent pain is the pain that is most commonly described in literature. And today we, uh, we will not be talking about acute or sudden pain, such as headaches, chest pain, abdominal pain, eye pain, throat pain, et cetera. Those are not typical of Parkinson's disease and they're very common in the general population. So before we delve right into pain, um, I'd like to present this slide on non-motor symptoms. This slide was put together um, uh, based on an article that was written in 2008 by Dr. Samuni. And what's missing on this slide back 12 years ago um, is pain. Uh, and uh, it tells us that we were not paying as much attention to pain in Parkinson's disease, even up until a decade ago, although it's been reported for at least two centuries. Uh, there's a whole host of non-motor symptoms that are quite disabling in Parkinson's disease and pain is, um, is part of that spectrum of non-motor symptoms um, and it should be actively discussed uh, with patients and caregivers and patients and caregivers should volunteer a history of pain, particularly if they're feeling pain. How common is chronic recurrent pain in Parkinson's disease? About 60 to 70% of people with Parkinson's disease report pain throughout the course of their illness. 
it waxes and wanes. It's not always, it doesn't always need tre active treatment, but it is present. So why is pain in Parkinson's disease so common? Well, there's a lot of studies now that are done with animals and with human beings that show that dysfunction of the dopamine circuits, as well as a dysfunction of pain pathways and circuits. There are various circuits in the brain. Uh, uh, some circuits modulate movement. Those are the circuits that are most commonly recognized as being um, uh, as being um, faulty or degenerating in Parkinson's disease. Um, but there are other circuits that modulate pain. Those circuits are also affected in Parkinson's disease. And that's why pain is a common symptom of Parkinson's disease. There is also a higher incidence of musculoskeletal problems in Parkinson's disease. And most importantly, pain is common in Parkinson's disease because it remains undertreated. There are certain kinds of pain that we will see that can be very easily treated. Um, um, is pain felt differently in Parkinson's disease? Why are we talking about pain? And the answer is yes, be just because of, um, uh, because of an altered sensation of pain. There is a reduced threshold to feeling pain in Parkinson's disease. And it's most likely because of the abnormalities in the pain circuits in the brain. Pain in Parkinson's disease uh, can be classified very broadly um, as that coming from Parkinson's disease and its treatment versus pain in Parkinson's disease from other causes. And we will be looking at both these categories. Uh, before we jump into the classification and see what are the various kinds of pain in Parkinson's disease, I'd like to show this slide, which has actually helped myself and a lot of my patients and caregivers in giving a good history of pain because pain cannot be quantified. Uh, the, the diagnosis of pain and where pain is coming from is based upon the narrative. There are some fundamental questions we ask patients. Um, to determine the cause of the pain, because you have to identify the cause of the pain in order to treat it appropriately. Um, and the, this is called the PQRST assessment of pain. P stands for precipitating and relieving factors. The fundamental question is what makes the pain worse? What makes it better? So th these are triggers for pain. Uh, Q stands for quality. How would you describe the pain? What does it feel like? Is it dull, sharp, achy, throbbing, knife-like, electric shock-like? Is it burning, tingling, or is it an icy kind of pain or a combination? This is important because we will see that nerve pain is typically sharp, shooting, tingly, but muscle pain is dull. It's a dull, deep ache. So it allows us to allows us to identify which particular tissue is the cause of pain. S is sight and severity. Where is the pain? Now that's important. Obviously, if you have pain in your right knee, your right knee needs to be examined carefully. So the sight of pain becomes important and the severity becomes important because that allows us to modulate treatment in terms of medications. Uh, you know, do you need a stronger medication if your pain is more severe? T is timing and treatment. When did the pain start? How long have you had the pain? And does it occur uh, intermittently or is it constant? And the most important question in the context of Parkinson's disease is, is there any relationship of the pain or the discomfort to the timing of medication? to the on state or the off state. Um, and we'll see why this is important shortly. On state is the state in which your medications are working well and you are living a full life. The off state is, is one in which medications are not working well and we have a lot of motor problems. Uh, and we do know that these states can occur uh, uh, in, in the same day several times, depending upon how advanced the disease is. And uh, of course, we, we'd like to know if there's been a treatment for pain in the past that has worked, can, you, can we prescribe the same medication over again? So these are all relevant questions uh, for pain assessment. 
so let's look at the first category, which is pain from Parkinson's disease and its treatment. There are two fundamental causes of pain that arise from Parkinson's disease and its treatment. The, the first, which cannot be overstated, is under treatment or under medication. A low dopamine state can cause significant discomfort. So it is very important for the physician to, to make sure that this, which is the most common treatable cause of pain in Parkinson's disease is addressed. And it is, it can be the very first sign of Parkinson's disease. It is under-recognized because pain um, is a very common presenting complaint in the population. How, do, how does pain from Parkinson's disease present? Truly, the description can be quite variable. However, with lar in large studies, people have described it as an electric discharge, throbbing, hot and cold, a generalized body pain. Um, so the description doesn't help very much, but the timing of the pain with respect to the medication timing is a very important part of the history. And typically, the part of the, the side of the body which is more affected with Parkinson's disease hurts more than the opposite side. So how do you correct under treatment or under medication in Parkinson's disease? Well, the answer is simple. You maximize dopaminergic treatment to improve motor symptoms. It is said that at any given time, a majority of people with Parkinson's disease are underdosed with their medications. And this is because perhaps the importance of levodopa has not been recognized in the community. And perhaps people still believe in that age old myth, which really has been disqualified that Parkinson's disease medication like levodopa are harmful or toxic or cause a progression or an advancement of the disease. There is absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. So there is no reason to under treat someone with Parkinson's disease. With effective treatment of this low dopamine state, pain improves in at least 48 to 50% of the people, which is good. If pain continues to persist despite treatment with dopaminergic medications, there is a role for just general analgesics, ibuprofen or Advil, to treat pain which is general, which, which occurs in the setting of Parkinson's disease even when uh, the symptoms are well controlled. Um, I'd like to talk about the on and off states a little bit because treatment of motor fluctuations in Parkinson's disease is very important. And to do this, I have a couple of videos that I will pay, play right now. Um, the first video over here on the left is of a gentleman who is well treated. I am going to mute the volume over here. Um, what we are having him do is the, um, uh, the typical unified Parkinson's disease rating scale examination. Uh, he is well treated. He is in the on state, his finger taps, his hand movements, um, his foot taps and his walking, you will see shortly, are, are near normal. Uh, and this is a good on state. He is not having any dyskinesias. He's able to get up without any problem. He walks this very long haul uh, without any issues. You will see when he is coming back a phenomenon that I'll point out to in just a second, uh, even in the on state. And if you see his left leg is turning in a little bit, uh, he's having some difficulty walking on his toes and heels. That is because he's having on dystonia in his left leg. Now this other video, which is playing automatically, shows this gentleman in the off state, in a low dopamine state, in which you see his finger taps are not as fast, um, and there's a little loss of expression on the face, and you will see um, these um, feet when he tries to stand up and walk turning in. And he has off dystonia. So you can have this condition called dystonia both in the on state and the off state, and it can be quite painful. Uh, and you see his left foot turning in there. Uh, you'll appreciate it a little bit more when he tries to 
uh, stand up and walk. And that is quite painful because it, if his foot turns in, uh, in the off state, and that is off state uh, dystonia. And I'd like you to remember this because this is one of the causes of pain in Parkinson's disease, either from a well-treated state or an off state. It's definitely significantly improved in the on state than it is in the off state. Um, the next video is of this gentleman over here who is in the on state, but this on state is marked by severe dyskinesias. So he is um, taking his Parkinson's medications, levodopa, uh, and he is extremely dyskinetic. Um, a reduction of the medication causes the off state. So he, you know, he'd rather be in this state where he can move um, than in the um, uh, that in the uh, off state. I'm going to pause the video here and go to this other video just to show you that dyskinesias are different in different people. They don't have to be so severe. That's a fairly dramatic video. And this woman over here uh, has writhing movements of the body. Uh, she these are also dyskinesias more on the right side, uh, but not as severe as the other gentleman. Uh, so everyone's Parkinson's disease is different. Everyone's dyskinesias are also different. And the reason I'm showing both these videos um, uh, is because both of these folks are quite uncomfortable with their dyskinesias. They're constantly writhing in their on state. So this is not a, a, a very good on in which they're having dyskinesias that are bothersome. Dyskinesias don't always have to be bothersome, but they can be and they can be quite intrusive. And I'd like to illustrate this phenomenon with the use of this, of this graph that was uh, put forth by Dr. Jankovic in 2005, about 15 years ago. This graph here shows uh, these curves, which illustrate the on and off states. When, when this curve dips below the baseline, you have the off state. When it goes up above, you have an on state with dyskinesias. And, um, this is where you would take your PD medications right at the beginning or when you're supposed to. And you would notice in the early stages of the disease, this is the therapeutic window that the good motor symptoms, the a good and state lasts for about six to eight hours. But as the disease progresses and you take your medications when you're wearing off, um, unfortunately, you do spend some time in the off state over here, um, and then you begin to have dyskinesias. So this is after a few years. Sometimes it can happen right away if you have young onset Parkinson's disease. It, it depends upon the number of dopamine cells in the brain. Um, and then you have a narrower therapeutic window of three to five hours as opposed to six to eight hours as time progresses. And then in, and in more advanced stages, that therapeutic window goes down to even less than uh, you know, two hours, sometimes even half an hour. Um, what happens after you have dyskinesias is then um, you start wearing off the dopamine levels in the brain fall and they fall a little more precipitously um, in the advanced stages than they do where this is a rolling hill, this becomes a sort of a mountain in which you have a sharp rise and a sharp fall. This is called wearing off. Uh, this is where you take PD medications when you're worn off, but before you turn on, you're spending more time in the off state before the upswing again. So what happens over time is this this on state, which was nice and big at the start of the disease, over time becomes quite narrow. And this is the good on without dyskinesias. Um, you do have on over here, but this is with dyskinesias. Now, why is this important? The next slide will show that. So 
in the off state here, you can have dystonia, which that gentleman had. The more time you spend in the off state, the more uncomfortable you can get with things like dystonia. Not everybody has dystonia, but the off state is marked by discomfort, whether it comes from dys dystonia or something else. In the on state, you can have dyskinesias, but you can also have dystonia. So this could be quite uncomfortable as well. Um, and then when you wear off, you're spending more time in the off state with, with dis, and more time with dystonia. So over time, you're spending more time in phases that can be quite uncomfortable with either dystonia or dyskinesia. And the pain fluctuation mirrors usually the motor fluctuation. So this becomes important when you're taking a pain history uh, is when you're asking the patient, does your pain, pain fluctuate? Are you, is it more painful in the off state and when you're having dyskinesias than in the, um, than in the on state without dyskinesias? So pain can follow the same pattern. And that becomes important because it tells us that if we treat the motor fluctuations, the ups and downs, we could potentially treat the pain as well by reducing the, the off state and minimizing the on state with dyskinesias, which is what we do in the treatment of motor fluctuations in Parkinson's disease. So this next slide talks about the treatment of both motor and pain fluctuations. This is a whole talk that I give for advanced Parkinson's disease. So this is sort of just the tip of the iceberg. We can have a much longer discussion on treatment of advanced Parkinson's disease. But in the context of pain, I think it's important to recognize that optimizing uh, dopaminergic treatment and reducing motor fluctuations is a very important strategy for reducing pain in Parkinson's disease. So how do you do that? Uh, you, you change medications around so you spend less time in the on state with dyskinesias, more time in the on state without dyskinesias, and then less time in the off state. You have to use many medications besides levodopa uh, to accomplish this. Um, if medications are not effective, then we go to surgical treatment and the entire treatment of motor fluctuations and pain fluctuations has to be customized to each person. In the optimization of uh, Parkinson's disease medication, a fundamental uh, rule is fractionation. Fractionation is taking smaller doses of medication more frequently. But unfortunately, what happens if you take levodopa or carbidopa more than four times a day is it increases pill burden significantly and it reduces compliance. There are those of us who can barely take a vitamin a day, or remember, and then we expect people to take medications four to five to six times a day. So that it definitely increases the burden of pill taking. There, luckily, we have a lot of therapies now to optimize um, the on state or PD medications without having to take drugs several times a day. And one of the medications that I use in my clinic very successfully is called Ritari. Ritari is a medication which is a unique mix of short acting and long acting carbidopa levodopa. It entirely can replace the short acting carbidopa levodopa. Um, you need fewer doses during the day and it decreases pill burden. Um, the medication is expensive, but it can be obtained through a special pharmacy. Uh, the drug company Amneal has a program uh, to get it to uh, patients. And most patients do fairly well on this medication. Uh, another option is a, a levodopa inhaler that came out a couple years ago called Inbrija. Uh, this is used when you have sporadic offs. Uh, when you realize you're feeling uncomfortable, there is pain, and there is a wearing off, tremors coming back, walking is slowing down. So it is an on-demand medication. You inhale the levodopa powder through the lungs. It bypasses the gut, so it's not affected by slow gut or constipation, which is very common in Parkinson's disease. And the on state occurs in 10 to 30 minutes, and this is an on without dyskinesias. So this is another way of, um, of supplementing levodopa. 
Uh, more often than not, we use various combinations of medications. This is the art of managing Parkinson's disease. And these medications are listed um, on this slide. We don't have to memorize them. This is, as I said, just for informational purposes, that this is what we have to do to optimize uh, Parkinson's disease medication. And it varies from person to person, uh, depending upon their state. What happens with dystonia, which does not um, uh, which does not respond to the usual dose of medications. And that is important to recognize because dystonia is a, a specific motor complication which may or may not improve completely with medication optimization. Well, we have another arrow in our quiver called botulinum toxin, which can be used very effectively for focal dystonia of the neck of the hand or off the foot which can persist even though medication is optimized. And dystonia can be painful, so it is important to recognize and treat it effectively, or it can hinder mobility like we saw in the, in the previous video. There are other medications we don't have to go into details that we use um, for painful dystonia um, that are also very effective, and sometimes we use a combination of drugs. Now what happens if you have optimized your medical uh, treatment, your Botox, et cetera, and all kinds of medication, and you still continue to have motor fluctuations? Well, we are lucky to have deep brain stimulation. And again, I'd like to emphasize that we do not use deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease for treatment of pain. Um, I'm presenting it in this talk because um, if pain is a byproduct of motor fluctuations, then it is possible that you could treat both motor fluctuations and pain at the same time. And more often than not, that is fairly successful. We have three platforms for uh, treatment of, uh, of Parkinson's with deep brain stimulation. We got the Boston Scientific Platform, which we're using um, with increasing regularity these days because the platform is, um, is fairly avant-garde. It has the ability to fine tune motor symptoms very well because of its technological platform. And people like the fact that it has a rechargeable battery that can last about 15, um, um, 15 years. The other two platforms are also good. We've been using them for a while. They're by Abbott and by Medtronic, two other companies that manufacture deep brain stimulation. Um, I wrote this editorial back in 2015 with Dr. Dewey in JAMA Neurology on the effect of deep brain stimulation um, in, uh, uh, on pain in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and the consensus uh, then was the same as the consensus now. It is beneficial for pain. In fact, pain improves in a lot of people with deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, but there is an issue with durability. After about eight or nine years, you have different kinds of pain uh, in Parkinson's disease that are not all treated with deep brain stimulation. So therefore, we cannot recommend deep brain stimulation for long-term treatment of pain in Parkinson's disease. Now, deep brain stimulation is being studied uh, for other kinds of pain. And it is shown to be effective, but not in the context of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so important takeaway, it is not recommended solely for the treatment of pain and Parkinson's disease. Um, I'd like to show you the video of this gentleman that we saw earlier uh, who uh, was, was um, very uncomfortable or looked very uncomfortable with his dyskinesias um, despite optimization of, of medication. Um, and uh, you'll see that after deep brain stimulation, a lot of the dyskinesias disappeared and uh, there was a relative calm in his body. If you continue to move that way throughout the day, there is a possibility that you will hurt your shoulders, your arms and legs, and it can be painful. This is the same gentleman with DBS uh, on a minimum amount of medications and the dyskinesias are not present. And that's exactly what DBS is for, is for the treatment of motor fluctuations. Very good. 
And moving on, um, in addition to uh, a deep brain stimulation, uh, another option for treatment of advanced Parkinson's disease uh, uh, with motor fluctuations is um, a medicine called Duopa, which is which is a carb carbidopa, levodopa, intestinal gel, and we know about this. Uh, this is uh, introduced directly into the jejunum through a tube and a pump, uh, to which is attached, and levodopa is squirted um, on a continuous basis. What this does is reduces the ups and downs, uh, and reduces dyskinesias and motor fluctuations through a different mechanism um, than DBS. Um, and it is an important um, strategy uh, for treatment of motor fluctuations, as well as pain associated with those motor fluctuations. Again, not recommended so solely for pain. Um, now that we talked about pain due to motor fluctuations and the ups and downs, are there other kinds of pains that persist despite the treatment of these motor fluctuations? And unfortunately, yes. Uh, central pain is um, not very well described, but uh, it does happen in Parkinson's disease, um, and it can be described as an electric buzzy feeling throughout the body. Um, the most common medications that are used are analgesics, muscle relaxants, medications like gabapentin, tricyclic antidepressants, duloxetine, which is a antidepressant, and another medication called pregabalin. Another state of discomfort, if not outright pain, is a condition called akathisia, which is a sense of inner restlessness. And this can happen when there is a low dopamine state. Um, not very common, but it has been described. And then we've got our favorite restless leg syndrome, very common in Parkinson's disease, described as a creepy, crawly, tingly, burning, achy, throbbing, uh, pick your choice of words, feeling uh, primarily in the legs, uh, causing sleep disturbance, difficulty with falling asleep. Very treatable uh, with the correct medications, and most common ones being um, the ones that we just talked about briefly. Additionally, premipexol, rapinarol, the retigidine and nupro patch, and in very refractory cases, opiates. We don't do that very often because non-opioid medications are very helpful in treating RLS. Uh, switching gears, what about pain in a PD from other causes, uh, not directly linked to PD. Uh, so we talked about pain from PD and its treatment. Well, we do need to have a good team with us in order to evaluate this kind of pain. Um, and the usual people on this team include the general practitioner, rehabilitation specialists, rheumatologists, pain specialists, orthopedists and neurosurgeons if necessary. And why is that? That is because one of the most common causes of pain in Parkinson's disease are musculoskeletal disorders. These are due to local injury, wear and tear, inflammation of muscles, ligaments, and connective tissues. Also osteopenia, which is thinning of the bones, osteoporosis and fractures. Not uncommon in the general population, but definitely more common in Parkinson's disease. Um, and this kind of pain can occur in the neck, low back, shoulder joints, hip joints, and the limb, most commonly described as a dull, deep ache, sometimes a sharp pain with movement if you don't have any cartilage in between the bones, a throbbing or crampy pain. People say they get Charlie horses or cramps at night that can be fairly, uh, you know, uh, uncomfortable and wake them up. This, this is all of this is under the rubric of musculoskeletal disorders, um, and very common uh, complaints include a frozen shoulder, which is which is due to a capsulitis and arthritis, a bent spine syndrome, which is a a, a marked or abnormal curvature of the spine, scoliosis, joint deformities, a stoop neck, and all kinds of foot problems from bunions to hammer toes, etc. 
very common in the general population, but more common in Parkinson's disease. And that's why we need a team of folks to help us evaluate it. The neurologist typically doesn't treat this kind of pain, but the neurologist is important in recognizing the incidence of this kind of pain and referring the patient to the appropriate specialist. Here's some dramatic videos that show what happens to feet if dystonia is not treated effectively it can result in permanent striatal deformities. And the same thing is um, uh, you see in these hands, which is a combination of arthritis and dystonia. And in this video, you see the classic bent spine syndrome, also called camptochormia, and, uh, which improves to some extent when this person is trying to uh, climb up the walls with his hands. Uh, so that is one of the ways in which we determine what is the, the range of motion. Well, all of these things can be, can be quite painful and they need to be treated effectively. In terms of musculoskeletal disorders, they could be the very first sign of Parkinson's disease. Um, and what, wh why do, why, it, uh, why are musculoskeletal disorders so common in Parkinson's disease? No one knows the mechanism, um, but it's a combination of things, uh, one of which is under treatment with dopaminergic medications, lack of movements of a limb about a joint. In fact, the more affected joint in Parkinson's disease, shortening of muscles. So that's why I tell my patients, you have to stretch. It's very important to stretch in Parkinson's disease. The general process of aging in which connective tissue changes take place, deconditioning, sitting, not moving too much, metabolic changes. There are, uh, there are medical conditions such as diabetes that cause problems with joints. Certain drugs can cause injuries to joints and limbs and then falls and fractures. Um, so we talked about the team approach. We have to involve the general practitioner and other specialists in the diagnosis of musculoskeletal disorders. MRIs and x-rays may be needed. Analgesics and anti-inflammatories are used uh, to treat these conditions, but I defer those to the general practitioner or the rehab specialist. You have to take into account kidney function, liver function, peptic ulcer disease, et cetera, in the treatment of uh, musculoskeletal disorders in Parkinson's disease. Rehabilitation is absolutely key, and the PTOT folks are very helpful in minimizing injury and maximizing movement. Sometimes steroid injections are used, and truly, when there is time, when it is time for a joint replacement, hip replacement, or a knee replacement, or shoulder replacement, then you have to go ahead and do that so you are able to move more freely. Um, what about the last category of pain, neuropathic pain. This pain is described as pins and needles. Uh, it can be described as numb, burning electric, or shock-like. Uh, simply, this is a problem with nerves, not muscular, not ligaments, bones, joints, or muscles. And the most common cause of neuropathic pain is a neuropathy. Uh, and the most common cause of neuropathy in the Western world is diabetes. Uh, another uh, cause for neuropathy or neuropathic, painful neuropathic pain in Parkinson's disease uh, is deficiency of vitamin B12 and folate. So it's important to make sure that those levels are, are normal. Um, if you have radiating pain, which is usually asymmetric, uh, in the shoulder, arm, back, or legs. Again, very common. This is called a radiculopathy or pinched nerves. It is, it is more common in Parkinson's disease than in the general population, but there's a big difference between radiculopathy and neuropathy uh, because the treatment of radiculopathy is different than the treatment of neuropathy. Um, and another example of a radiculopathy in common parlance is sciatica, pain that shoots down from the back down to the foot. Uh, for neuropathic pain, um, a neurologist can actually uh, uh, treat this very effectively. General practitioners also do that. We do blood tests to make sure there's no glucose intolerance or underlying diabetes, vitamin supplementation. Sometimes we order MRIs of the neck or back to make sure there is not a, a pinched nerve uh, from a herniated disc. 
electromyography or EMG can be really helpful in identifying a neuropathy versus a reticulopathy, particularly if both coexist, which is not uncommon. Um, rehabilitation is key, as, as we talked about. And then there are medications. We try to be very conservative if there is not ongoing tissue damage. So we start with topicals like lidocaine gel, and then the very common gabapentin. Precabalin is very effective, and then there are other medications. When there are when there is a pinched nerve causing severe pain and more importantly weakness, people should be referred to the neurosurgeon or the orthopedic surgeon to decompress that nerve. Uh, how about other conditions in Parkinson's disease that are very common um, that accentuate pain? Uh, and this I cannot stress uh, is absolutely critical. Depression, stress, and anxiety go hand in hand with pain. So the multidisciplinary treatment of pain in Parkinson's disease absolutely mandates doing an intake and asking the patient about mood. Um, and that and mood disorders need to be separately treated. Uh, an ineffective treatment of mood um, uh, results in an ineffective treatment of pain. We talked about lack of exercises. Um, um, stretching is very important to minimize pain. And um, uh, lack of sleep, constipation, and low blood pressure. Those are three um, very important things uh, that accentuate pain. Uh, low BP uh, is something that causes a reduced perfusion of muscles and nerves. Um, and when you have decreased perfusion of muscles and nerves, then you have a, a, a generalized discomfort and pain. So all of these need to be taken into account uh, when we are treating pain in Parkinson's disease. And a question always comes up about marijuana and Parkinson's disease uh, and pain in Parkinson's disease, uh, particularly in Washington where it is legal. Well, it, there are actually more questions and answers for the use of marijuana for pain in Parkinson's disease. Um, we do not know the effect of the two compounds, THC and CBD, uh, in brains of Parkinson's disease. What are the long-term effects? What are the long-term benefits? So I personally do not prescribe it specifically for Parkinson's disease because we don't have a lot of um, a, a lot of data to support that. Uh, but if someone has severe pain from another cause, such as cancer, uh, et cetera, and they have Parkinson's disease, that patient is referred to their pain doctor for, uh, for a holistic treatment for pain with you know, maybe marijuana or with um, opioid or narcotic medications. Um, so I think this is my last slide. I went a little bit over. Uh, to summarize, pain in the causes of pain in Parkinson's disease are myriad. Uh, we should employ the PQRSD technique to identify the cause of pain. It is very helpful. We must optimize both motor and non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease for effective treatment of pain and multidisciplinary treatment um, for non-Parkinson's disease uh, pain uh, such as musculoskeletal disorders is absolutely important. Um, so with that, I end. I thank you. Um, if, you if you'd like information in any other topics in Parkinson's disease, you want to hear this talk again, an updated version, uh, please contact uh, the American Parkinson's Disease Association. And I really thank uh, all of you for, uh, for your attention. So I'm going to move over to the question answer phase and hand it over to Jen. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We had a lot of questions. Oh, am I still muted? Can you hear me, PK? No, it doesn't say that I'm muted. I can hear you, Jen. Oh, weird. Dr. Kamani, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, can other people hear me? Maybe you could type in, okay, you can hear me. I'm hearing from the chat. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'll give you instructions and I'll see what I can do about getting Dr. Kamani the questions. Um, so we're gonna Jen, pause a moment. I oh, can't you can hear, hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm gonna text you. <laughs> um, right. Will you text him, Jean? Um, so let's see. Jean, will you come on and see if he can hear you? 
Dr. Kamani, can you hear me? No, it's something mm. with his. Something. Will you text him, Jean, and I'll give instructions. So if you have questions um, for Dr. Kamani, um, you can type them into the Q&A box. Um, I am gonna send him a message, or he's being sent a message. Well, technology, super fun. Hmm. Many of you um, submitted questions um, in advance. And so he's addressed some of those. And then we have other questions coming in. So I guess the question would be, can he see the questions? So we're gonna text him and find out if he can see the questions. I'm texting. Okay. <laughs> Not sure what's happening with the microphone. We could all hear him just fine. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He said he can't see the questions in the QA. Oh, maybe he has to unshare his screen. I think I can share your now. screen. Oh, there you are. Oh, oh yay. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not entirely sure what happened. I apologize. Okay, we're, well, it's, we can, you can hear us. That's great. All right. I, I can so, hear you and I can see you and I'm ready for questions. Sorry excellent, about that. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, there's a question about uh, DBS. Um, is there an upper age limit for DBS? Uh, no, no, there is no upper age limit specifically for DBS. Um, it is the physiological age as opposed to the chronological age that is important. Um, what we do in DBS, as you know, is we take into account the overall fitness of the person and there is a process we go through called the neuromodulation process. Uh, so people have had DBS done at age 80, at age 85. It just depends on how fit the person is overall for surgery and whether they are um, you know, good candidates, but age per se is not a limit or a ceiling. Okay, great. We've had a number of questions about um, posture, um, PISA syndrome, really and a lot of it relating to back pain. Can you talk a little bit about how Parkinson's causes those um, like that PISA syndrome and that Charlie Chaplin gait, and then what you can do about it in relation yeah, to pain. Sure, so let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, there are two basic kinds of postural abnormalities in Parkinson's disease. One is from a mechanical bend of the spine, not unlike scoliosis. Unfortunately, that is also very common in the general population, and there are no medications that can straighten a mechanically bent spine. There are surgeries that are available, um, but for that you'd have to consult an orthopedic surgeon to determine if the spine can be straightened. Those are pretty extensive surgeries. Um, Pisa syndrome, also called camptochormia, which is the, um, which is the uh, technical term for it, can cause a um, forward bend of the spine or a sideward bend of the spine because of contractions of muscles. Uh, and that falls under this large rubric of the term dystonia. And it can happen over time. Uh, it is a fairly problematic thing we see in some people with Parkinson's disease. Sometimes it can improve uh, by increasing dopaminergic medications um, and making sure that there is not a low dopamine state. At other times, it can happen in the high super high dopamine state and it can present as a dyskinetic dystonia. Not very common, uh, but it can happen. So either way, it is usually a dystonia. And one of the ways to differentiate scoliosis uh, from Pisa syndrome is usually in Pisa syndrome or camptochormia, you are able to lay flat on a bed. The spine straightens itself out. 
that typically doesn't happen in a fixed mechanical deformity of the spine. There are ways of treating Pisa syndrome with Botox, but unfortunately it's not very effective because the muscles that cause Pisa syndrome are very deep abdominal muscles and you cannot reach them with the Botox needle, unfortunately. Um, and then there is deep brain stimulation. And just recently, there was literature published that deep brain stimulation for Pisa syndrome is effective in about 25% to 30% um, of patients. So to summarize it, one first needs to determine if it is a mechanical problem like scoliosis or Pisa syndrome from dystonia, and then approach treatment accordingly. Great, great. Um, there's been a number of questions about, I guess I would call them non-traditional approaches to pain. I don't know if non-traditional is the right, but non-medicated approaches. So can you talk a little bit about some of those effective things like acupuncture or yoga, or are those kind of therapies, have you seen that effective in treating some of the pain? Uh, yes, it entirely depends on the patient because different treatments work for different people. We are wired differently. And these, these um, non-traditional or complementary treatments uh, take each individual into account. To break it down, the most common non-traditional treatment for postural deformities is classical physical therapy and occupational therapy. I always like my PT and OT experts to evaluate the patient to determine where is the deformity coming from and to design sensible scientific exercises because one of the things you don't want to do is treat pain of one kind and then develop pain of another kind by doing it in a non-scientific fashion. You want to do it very sensibly, particularly with postural deformities or musculoskeletal disorders. Once you have a good intake by a PTOT that clears you, then you can consider floor exercises such as yoga, but you definitely need people who know about yoga and Parkinson's disease. And Jen, you and I did a, a talk on yoga and Parkinson disease, the early part of this year in which I looked at literature and there was ample literature to support. Yoga is very important for Parkinson disease, for pastoral deformities. It can definitely mitigate pain significantly, but it needs to be done by someone who knows neuroanatomy and body anatomy in Parkinson disease well. Acupuncture is also shown to have lasting benefits in Parkinson's disease at least three months after the last treatment. The problem with the data in each of these is very small samples of people were taken and studied. And one of the problems with pain is the placebo effect. It's very, very common. Uh, so it is very important to do very large studies randomize them appropriately to determine if a particular treatment is going to be beneficial or not. But uh, I am a huge proponent of any sensible complementary pain reduction treatment that does not interact with the patient's medications and that does not uh, take an existent problem and make it worse. Great, thank you. Um, in relation to that, there was a, a question about, are there like vitamins and nutritional supplements that can be effective in, in treating pain? I would imagine it depends on the pain and speak with your physician, but can you answer to that? Yes, no, definitely I can. And that's actually a very legitimate question. We talked about osteoporosis and osteopenia. And we know, particularly in these parts, people can be calcium and, and vitamin D deficient. Uh, and it is a very important thing, particularly in Parkinson's disease, there is a significantly higher risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. And then in certain parts like our northern latitudes, that risk increases in orders of magnitude, and not just in women, in men as well. So falling, stumbling uh, can cause fractures, 
whereas a simple stumble may not have if you didn't have osteopenia and Parkinson's disease. So there is a big role for calcium vitamin D supplementation, not huge amounts. You cannot go crazy because these are fat soluble molecules and calcium has this notorious side effect of constipating people. And in Parkinson's disease, constipation is very common already. So sensible supplementation of calcium and vitamin D are important. B12 um, and folate, as I said, are very important vitamins to, uh, to treat neuropathic pain from B12 deficiency. So that becomes really important. And then there are certain other minerals that are used, uh, not based on a scientific sort of uh, uh, background, but people have used magnesium um, oil and magnesium supplements to mitigate pain. Magnesium, as we know, is also used for relieving constipation. And one of the most neglected things in Parkinson's disease is, uh, is, is days of constipation exacerbating back pain significantly. And when people strain, they can actually blow a disc. So these are byproducts of things that are treatable. They may not cause pain directly, but they are byproducts of these processes uh, that can be treated to mitigate pain and discomfort. Great, great. Yeah, I had a, there was a lot of questions about back pain. Um, yeah. And it sounds like a variety of things can cause back pain. Is that correct? A variety of things can cause back pain. The most common cause of back pain in the general population is wear and tear and aging degenerative disc disease. It, it's things that I am doing now is looking forward, not sitting back, um, long standing poor posture, not engaging the core, which 90% of the general population does. Back pain is ubiquitous with or without Parkinson's disease. But with Parkinson's disease, it becomes extremely problematic because it can curtail movement. And we know that to keep moving and to be anxious and to keep exercising and be fit is doubly important important in Parkinson's disease. So when my patients have back pain, I do bring in the spine experts at Swedish and the physical medicine and rehab department and the sports department. We have a complex spine clinic as well. And that is there um, and that's exactly in their wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, and I say, you know what, I'm going to send you to the experts in back pain to, to ensure that you are getting conservative treatment first before you need surgery. And we do know that conservative treatment in a lot of cases with pinch nerves and degenerative disc disease works as well, if not better than surgery. Great. Is it, is it clear, you know, you talk about the general population and pain, um, is it clear that people with Parkinson's disease have more pain than other seniors in their 60s, 70s, and 80s? This was a question. Is it more common in Parkinson's than it is in the general population? Is there just statistics on that? There are statistics on that, that in healthy controls without Parkinson's disease compared to in Parkinson's disease, pain is more common. And this is based on two or three studies of about 400 to 500 individuals. You would still consider those small studies. Um, you would want tens and thousands of people to be studied, but those studies have not been done. So in the studies that have been done with 400 to 500 individuals in Parkinson's disease versus healthy controls, pain is much more common in people with Parkinson's disease. And the reason is not necessarily because things that cause pain are more common. As I said in one of my slides, the pain pathways are altered. There is an altered sensation to pain. So people, feel pain and perceive it more differently in Parkinson's disease than they do in the general population. Okay. So I'm gonna take a couple more questions here and then we've, we've run long, but you're, a lot of you are still sticking around, so thank you. Um, I did have a number of questions about muscle rigidity. Yes. Um, and you did talk about that in your um, presentation a little bit. Can you just do a quick summary on what 
therapies are Absolutely. effective on muscle rigidity? Right, so let's unpack muscle rigidity. First, we gotta find out why the muscle is rigid. The more, most common cause of a rigid muscle in Parkinson's disease is the term rigidity, which is a diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease. And the most effective treatment is dopaminergic treatment. So you must maximize that to reduce rigidity. There are other causes. A dystonic muscle is a shortened muscle, can be very rigid. So dope, as we saw, dopamine therapy may or may not work for a dystonic rigid muscle. So at that point, we use things like Botox and, and just general muscle relaxants, um, as long as we are not making the person loopy because muscle relaxants can be very sedating. So that's muscular rigidity. Then there can be stiffness in muscles from arthritis. And you, you may have very limited range of motion, and we see that commonly, which may have nothing to do with Parkinsonian rigidity. So the cause of muscle rigidity is important to identify in order to treat it effectively. Okay. Um, let's see. Gosh, it's so hard to pick out these questions because there's so many. Um, so I'm going to, um, this, this is a question that has to do, um, there's a lot of actually questions about headaches as well. Sure. And I know that you said at the beginning that you weren't really going to address that. Um, but if people have a lot of questions about it, are, are headaches related to P Parkinson's or is that a different thing? And then where do you go with that? And cluster headaches is another one that's kind of come up a little bit. Yeah, sure. No, not direct relationship to Parkinson's disease, but these could be famous last words. 10 years down, a study could be done and we could see that headaches are also very common in Parkinson's disease. You know, we used to believe that a lot of things were not common in Parkinson's disease, but now we do see that they are. But the treatment of headaches would would depend on the kind of headaches. A headache fellowship is two years long. People go to school for two years just to treat headaches. So someone has something beyond a simple tension headache that can be you know, resolved by taking Tylenol once in a while and we all have had headaches, right? We've all had headaches. Mm -hmm. um, there is no such thing as a Parkinson disease headache per se. Okay. A headache okay. is a headache, and I would refer that person to their general practitioner, and if they begin to have migraines, and if they begin to have cluster headaches, and they begin to have, uh, you know, ophthalmic headaches, complex headaches, I send them to my colleague in the headache department uh, to treat them accordingly. Not unlike you would have, you know, you would have a heart problem, and then you would send them to the cardiologist. You always go to the person who is a specialist in that particular field. Right. So that team approach is, is very important. Super important. Yeah. Very important. And um, it struck me during the um, during your presentation that unpacking the cause of pain is really important yeah. to address the treatment of pain. That's absolutely. And right. so, can you address a little bit about sort of like a, a symptom tracker or a way of like what is what do you suggest to people to try to start to communicate with someone like you on how do you figure out where this is coming from and when this is happening that's a really very important question i'm glad you asked i was over the weekend going to polish my slides whittle them down and send them to you okay <laughs> so the data that was in my slides could be disseminated to your audience Mm -hmm. So they have this as reference material because that P PQRSD slide is absolutely key. That's what doctors and nurse practitioners, et cetera, want to know. What's causing your pain? What's the quality? Is it radiating? That allows the physician, it's not the patient's responsibility to diagnose their own pain ever, but to be able to give an appropriate narrative really helps the, uh, or helps the doctor. So if if people have that tool, then they will know how to express themselves to the physician, which will allow the physician to be able to diagnose pain better. Most physicians should be able to use the PQRSD tool, but maybe because they're really busy, they don't, you know, many things come in the way. So I was hoping to send you this, a PDF of my slides so people could use it as a reference. And then there are apps um, that are available that are pain tracker apps, not unlike your excellent symptom tracker app for Parkinson disease, uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So there are pain tracker apps as well that are available.
Yeah, so taking that role in tracking when mm-hmm. and how and how it feels is Absolutely. really important so that you can say to your doctor, this is what I'm experiencing. That's exactly right. The doctor should be able to elicit it, but you, if you are prepared, that makes the conversation flow so well than just a vague description. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap up the questions. Um, if there are other burning questions that you just did not get answered, um, definitely send them to me in an email, um, and I can communicate them to Dr. Kamani and see if he can. We can go between and he can answer some of your burning questions. Um, but we are going to wrap up today's session. So I want to. Thank you for joining us um, about this very important topic. Um, I will be sending the slides out to folks um, who have tuned in and this presentation will be up um, on our APDA Northwest YouTube channel. So you can just go and search for APDA parkinson.org slash Northwest and you will find all the great videos that are up there. Um, including the conversation that we are going to do live at one o'clock today with Bill Rasmussen, um, founder of ESPN, and Dave Grosby, uh, sports radio host extraordinaire. They're going to have a really great conversation, I think. Um, they're wonderful individuals. And our uh, conversation with our penguin guy, Charles Bergman, um, who we talked to yesterday. So that will be up on the YouTube channel. So it's not all about... Parkinson's and symptoms. There's other stuff. So come join us with that as well. So um, stay tuned for future programs. Um, if you enjoyed this program and would like to support APDA with a donation, then it definitely helps allow us to do more programs like this. And we are having a walk. Um, we are going to walk together, but separately um, mm -hmm. on Sunday, May 31st. So you can find more information about that on our website. We're going to have a Zoom kickoff with, um, with Bill Rasmussen and Dave Grosby, our sports guys. Um, and we're going to raise money and awareness for Parkinson's disease. So we hope you can join us. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, Dr. Kamani. Any last words? Um, Jen, I oh, yes. In I put in the chat the link to the APDA symptom tracker um, and information about it that Dr. Kamani mentioned in case anyone's interested in that. Terrific. Thank you, Jean. Thank I you. just wanted to say thank you to you, Jen, to Jean, to, to Dwight, to all of our uh, APDA Northwest uh, directors and board members and executive directors and the audience. So it's really an honor to be able to work with you guys um, in improving uh, the care for our patients. So thank you. Thank and you. Have for a being great welcome. weekend, everybody. You are very welcome. And thanks for being a part of the APDA family. Thanks, we really appreciate you. And thank you all who joined us in the audience. And we hope that you have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you again, hopefully in person soon. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.